This is Stephen Knight. I'm the writer and director of Lock, and I'm just going to say a few words about the making of the film and how it came about as the film goes through. This was actually, like a lot of things in this film were shot in sequence, this was the first shot of the first day of shooting. And I remember the feeling of, what the hell are we doing? And is this going to work? At the last minute, they withdrew permission to, to actually put the cameras inside this building site, so we had to get a cherry picker and look over the fence. The whole idea for the film was, was to do things differently and to try and shoot a film almost as if it was a play. And these opening scenes are the most conventional bits of the whole film. But even here, we wanted to do things slightly differently and express a character through his socks. The car, as you can see, is a BMW. Seeing this loving pack shot, I almost wish now that we'd done some sort of lucrative deal with BMW, but we didn't. They lent us two cars for two weeks. We chose it because it's a, I suppose it's the sort of car a successful site engineer would have, and also it gave us plenty of room to put the cameras in. This is the decision. This is the decision that normally would come at the end of a film, but. I decided to put it at the beginning. This is when he decides to change his entire life. And there it is. He's now decided he's going to do what he considers to be the right thing. And that's my hometown, Birmingham, which is not known as a beautiful city, but I think it is. This is a place called Spaghetti Junction, which is a big motorway intersection, and it's very Birmingham. But look at it, it's beautiful. And Harris Zambalukas did such a fantastic job of taking industry and motorways and lights and making them into an installation work of art. Uh, it's Ivan. Got your message. I'm on my way and I'll get there. I'm in the car now and, uh, and it'll be about an hour and a half unless there's traffic. Now, if the nurses or anybody wants to talk to me, I'm only on this number. Or if, or if the doctors or anybody at all they need to talk to me, I'll be on this number. That will be okay. I will get there. And there is the name traffic should be okay. Locke with a nod to the philosopher John Locke, the rationalist. And as you can see, the first caller is Bastard, which is an illegitimate child, which is quite relevant to the rest of the story. Hello, can I speak to Gareth, please? He's not back yet. Um, can I ask his calling? Ivan Locke. Can I say what it's regarding? Uh, yes, concrete. Can you, um, can you tell him if it's urgent? Can you tell him to call me back? Yeah, does he have your number? Uh, yes, yes, he does. Sorry, what was your name again? Ivan Locke. Something about concrete. That's right, yes. Can you, uh. Will he know what? Uh, no, no, he won't. Uh, something has come up and I need to tell people it's urgent. Sorry, what? I said, I said it's urgent. Very urgent, thank you. We shot establishers of the car from outside without Tom, but all of the scenes with Tom in, the car was on a low loader with the wheels taken off. Um, we had three cameras at all times mounted inside the car. One of them always with a sensible angle, one with less sensible angle, one with quite a weird angle. And we would set off. Uh, the other actors were in a hotel conference room near to the motorway with some red wine and biscuits. And I was on the low loader with Tom with visual contact and audio contact. And I would say action only once. We would set off. I would cue the calls from the actors in the conference room in sequence and we would film the whole film from beginning to end. We would then have a break and we'd film the whole film in sequence again, trying to do the whole film twice a night. We ended up with 16 versions of the movie filmed in sequence. 
So it was an anything but conventional way of making a film, but it was good fun and it meant that the actors could calibrate their own performances. We pulled over every 27 minutes because we were using red cameras with a memory card that lasts 30 minutes. So we would pull over at the side of the road and it was a sort of like a Formula One pit stop where we would go in, change the memory cards, change the lenses, change the angles, and then set off again. Tom would be left alone to stay in character, and then we would pick up where we left off and go through the film that way. So it was almost like a naive way of making a film, of, of, of trying to rediscover sort of some of the theatre elements of filmmaking. Tom, by the way, really had a cold. Um, this wasn't a part of the artifice. It was on day one when Tom showed up, he had a bad cold, and so rather than try and hide it, we decided to use it and add it to Ivan's miseries. Okay. Well, I will go through everything with you, and it'll be okay. You know where I am, Ivan? I'm at the service station. I'm turning the fucking van around. Put the other lads on the hard shoulder. I was halfway home. Yeah. What the fuck's happened? It's a family thing. Right. That GPS, I hoped, would convey something of the, the destiny of Ivan, that his future effectively is through the windscreen and in the GPS, and his past is in the rearview mirror, which is where he speaks to his dead father. Okay, just from when the sun comes up tomorrow morning until when it's all been pumped. I need you to hold it together for me, OK? You won't be alone. I can be on the phone. I will talk to you every five minutes until the pump is finished. Talk to me what, on the phone? On the phone. What? Have you gone mad? No, I don't think so. Ivan, at 5.45 tomorrow morning, we have 350 metric tons of wet concrete being delivered to the site. We've got 200 trucks from all over the fucking country. That police car going by was uh, what I think of as a series of happy accidents that happened while we were shooting. That one was a real car, real police car going by, and it was at perfect timing. So on that occasion, that's the take we used when we did the edit. I hate myself even hearing myself even saying this, but if someone has died, like your mother or... or no one is dead, go Donald. Have to go okay? Listen, I need you to just do this, OK? I need you to be there with enough stuff and the right heads when the sun comes up. That's it. Oh, holy fucking Mary, I can't... I'm a fucking concrete farmer. You've never seen me reading it and written down on paper. You're I can't... OK. Listen, you're OK. You know how to run a pump, don't you? You know how to run trucks back to back. And turn trucks back, and you know how to test for I've never even shoveled on a pump this big. Well, it's the same. It's just there's more of it. You just, you just do the same, but for longer. You check it, slump it, send it back if it's piss, and pump it if it's right. That's it. Well, what's Garrett say about this? Well, I haven't spoken to him yet. Oh well, he's gonna fucking, he's gonna, he'll go fucking sideways and around the houses. Like I know. Arse is on fire. I know. I know. Ivan, you're, you're going to get the sack. I know, Donald. Jeez, you're the best foreman I've ever fucking worked with. The best site manager. What the hell is this? It's going to make you're going to risk. You're going to risk the sack. Look, I need you to do this for me, Donald. Right? So start rounding up some cowboys, then call me back. I'll be on the road. The actor playing Donald is Andrew Scott, who's one of the best actors we have. I'm like a lot of the other cast who agreed to appear, not in Vision. And he's a good friend of Tom's, and sometimes you can see that friendship coming through, which was fantastic for the performance of both of them. Ivan Lock. Ivan? Where are you? Um, I just got admitted I'm in the um, labour ward. It's called Bailey Ward. Did they say how long? Um, five centimetres. Uh, what does that mean? Dilated. Well, I know what that means, but how long? I, they just... Uh, they just left me. On, I'm on my own. Is there a bell? A what? I don't know. A, a, a buzzer or something to get to get a nurse. They, they just put their head around. They said it could be hours. Now, are you okay? Um, I need the loo. Well, tell them. You tell them. Well, there's no one here. Well, is there a bell? They, they don't have bells. What do you mean? When they put their head around the door, you tell them that you need the lavatory. Like a pain I've never had right inside all the way up to my chest. Have you talked to anyone about the pain? No, what, what do you mean? Ivan, what do you mean? I'm saying, have you talked to anybody about stopping the pain? Have you, have you decided? Well, they said, let's see. Well, just have whatever that is, seriously. 
What? I, I don't know, for the pain, because it's fucking... Jesus, it's... Well, it's... it's... It's cold and all the windows are open. Well, tell them to close the windows. And the traffic is okay. <laughs> Go to the lavatory. I'll be there. Have you even told your wife that someone's having your baby? I'm about to do that. I have a, I have a list of things that I have to do tonight when oh. I'm driving. So I, am I on a list? Yes, tonight, yes. Do you love me? That's a question you're asking, probably because of the pain or something. How could I love you? I, I, that brilliant actress is Olivia Coleman, who's, again, I was shocked when she said yes and agreed to sit in a conference room of a hotel from 9pm till 4am with just some biscuits and some wine. Hi, love. But I think she does a fantastic job, and as the relationship develops, I think that we really start to see the quality of the performances as they're calling in. And this is Ruth Wilson, who is playing Ivan's wife, and... He's a very prestigious actress, and I think it was interesting after about, I think it was the second day I'm not coming home. of doing this, of being called to the microphone and making their calls and not seeing anything. They had no visual references. Which phone are you on? I think they were wondering what the hell was going on. So I showed, on the third night, I showed them some footage of what we were doing, and I think it quelled a mutiny. Uh, but they, they loved the pictures and so we'd already spent five days round a table reading the script with Tom and myself so any direction that needed to be done was done then. What's happened? Will you just, will you get to the phone upstairs? What's happened? And when we went on the road everyone was equipped with what they needed so that I was able to keep any direction to an absolute minimum and just let the whole thing flow and run and film it exactly as if it were a piece of theatre, as if it were a play on stage. And then I think after the fourth night, I wrote a letter to, or the third night, I wrote a letter to all of the actors who were phoning in and offered them different motivations for their character so that we had variation. For example, I suggested to Ruth Wilson, who plays Ivan's wife, that actually she wants to get rid of Locke, that she actually wants him to leave and that this is her opportunity. And... She, you know, it, she's someone who married below herself and now she's got a chance to get rid of him. Just to vary the thing. And it was the same with the other characters, all giving them all different ideas. And in the end, it was possible to cut between the two motivations, which sort of suggests to me that we all have many motivations at the same time. And that in two different phone calls, you can have two different moods, which I think helps with the realism of it. She's quite old and she lives on her own. She's 43 or something. She's a... Uh... Why are you telling me about some woman? This is the only time I ever did this, Katrina. The only time. Look, after the block was settled in, there were some drinks to celebrate. Well, the block going in is a big thing because it's at the base of the whole building, and she came back to the guest house. She isn't what you would call an oil painting, but it was wet and cold, and she talked about being lonely, and I talked about being happy when... But I'm, but I'm lonely sometimes, you know, when I was away and, and there was this wine and um, this was the only time I did this in all our 15 years. And now tonight she's giving birth. Tonight she's giving birth and it's mine. This is where I wanted to suggest and reflect. When you're on your own in a car, I think you're alone in a very particular way and your body's doing something, it's driving, so your mind is free and it's free to look at things you've done, things you shouldn't have done, uh, things you said and shouldn't have said, and there's your destiny ahead of you and behind you is the things that you've left behind. So the car itself offered up a lot of nice imagery. The stickers were Tom's suggestion. He's big in the Help for Heroes charity, which is a charity for veterans returning from Afghanistan. And it's exactly the sort of thing that Ivan would be doing. And also there's a sticker for a lifeboat charity because we felt that 
the car was like a ship in a storm and the storm is all around and it is a sort of a lifeboat it's someone trying to save their own life ivan lock yeah, it's gareth ivan i just spoke to donald this had better be more than good hello gareth speak to me only about tomorrow morning ivan right well um i won't be on site for the pump tomorrow oh sweet monkey jesus this is not happening uh, the truth is, tonight, I'm going to become a father. And uh, she's in London. So I have to be there. Okay, okay. I... Hmm? Jesus. I'm just going to read you something, Ivan. Are you listening? Yes. Good luck tomorrow with the pour. We just had it confirmed by CGO that this will be the biggest single concrete pour ever made in Europe outside of nuclear military projects. I know the day this is Tom the really time. nearly sneezing and as with many other things we wanted to keep these happy accidents in and that's the medicine that he was really taking so we thought well why not reflect the reality I think often in fiction you can either have a cold or you can have your marriage breaking up but you don't have them at the same time whereas in reality you really can have both so you're the man in charge of the entire operation but with 10 hours to go you've decided you ain't gonna be there well Donald will handle it and he's a good man do you fucking Dare say that to me! Don't you fucking dare give qualitative appraisals on my stuff and say good man like it's going off to buy a fucking ice cream! Jesus, this is fucking concrete like shit, Ivan. Like piss. When it comes, you pump it. Like babies. This is a joke to you. No, no, right now, nothing is a joke anymore. And so... It's not your wife giving birth. No. Oh, it's someone else. Ivan! You're the last person on Earth. Yes, I know I am the last person on Earth, but it happened. And this, this woman, she can't just, she can't give birth on her own. I have made a decision. There is nobody else who could be with her. Okay? She has no friends what? in London and is quite a fragile person. Fragile? You're going to abandon the biggest fucking concrete pour in Europe to hold someone's fucking hand because she's fragile. And because the baby was caused by me. That is my decision I have made. I have not behaved in the right way with this woman at all. I have, I have behaved in a way that isn't like me. But now I am going to do the right thing. Why, Chicago can go to fucking hell. It is a decision that I, I, I have made. I'm not going to turn back. Do you know how many millions of pounds are riding on tomorrow? If any one of those pumps box up, Ivan, we are facing 10 million pounds worth of losses in 15 minutes. So if we get that 15 minutes for the whole morning, a total shutdown, a hundred million dollars. That's the rattle in the car that normally you would pull over and solve that rattle and get rid of it. But again, we wanted to keep things real, so we carried on with the rattle happening and I think it sort of adds to the to the pressure on I poor Ivan. I to myself that I will not allow the poor to fuck up. Oh, this is a joke. Are you wearing a fucking red note? This is a fucking joke, Ivan. I'm going to call Chicago, right? If it weren't for the fact that you've been so solid for us for so many years, I'd fire you down the phone. Ivan, have you lost your fucking mind? I have made my decision. This is where I wanted to suggest another motive for Ivan's journey south. His father is someone to whom something like this would have happened often and he would have walked away from it, but Ivan wants to prove that he's not governed by destiny or predestination or genetics. He's in charge of his own fate, and so that's why he's driving his own car south. Laughing at my predicament. I think in cars, people do talk to themselves, and they do strange things. And I wanted this to be a sort of internal monologue that is also a soliloquy. And the looks into the rearview mirror are looking at the past. And from now on, I hoped that those headlights that you're seeing coming into the rearview mirror are almost like the eyes of someone watching you. You know, in fact, I would like to take a fucking shuffle and take you up out of the fucking 
around and make you watch me tonight. I would pull open your eyes and kick the mud and worms and shit out of your fucking ears just for the duration of this journey. Because it's me driving. Me. Not you. And unlike you, I will drive straight to the place where I should be. And I will be there to take care of my... Take care of my fuck up. A lot of people have asked me why concrete um, as the material that he works with. There was a couple of reasons for that. When I was much younger, I worked on building sites and it was the arrival of concrete that was the most dramatic event because when concrete arrives, you have to deal with it. It's going to go hard somewhere and if it's in the wrong place, it has to be dug out again. And lots of people have their jobs on the line when the concrete arrives. So it's all part of the thing of this whole film, which was to point the camera at what would be considered to be an ordinary man and see the drama that's there. He's not Jason Bourne or James Bond. He's a construction engineer but he's heroic in his own way. And the other thing about concrete is that it's this shapeless but solid material, and this is how Ivan operates. He operates in the hard world. He wants concrete things, he wants solid things, he wants to be rational, like John Locke. And normally, in his day-to-day -day work, that approach works perfectly well. But on this night, it's not going to serve him well at all. But the concrete is obviously real and metaphorical. And to learn more about the realities of the concrete delivery and how it works, I spent some time with the man, the site engineer, who did Ivan Locke's job on the building of, I think it's one of the tallest buildings in London, called the Shard. And he spent three years of his life building this thing. And he talked in great detail about concrete and its various permutations and how delicate it is. And it was fascinating. And he was a very practical, solid man who'd had many sleepless nights, slept on the construction site. And it just made me think he would get in the car and drive home and no one would know who he is. No one will know who he is after the building's built. But, you know, there are people whose lives are dramatic and worthy of a film. And, and this night for Ivan, he's made a mistake that anyone could make. It's not a tragedy that's going to get into the papers or going to get on the local news, but for the people involved, it's the end of the world, and it's sort of pointing the camera at that sort of event that I wanted to try with this film. You have the phone numbers of the plants, don't you? Yeah. Call them now, Donald. Call every one of those bastards. Get them to repeat the order C6 on the nose, or we send those trucks back. Seriously, those fuckers will fuck you up with the water in their gullies if it rains tomorrow. Well, it's not going to rain tomorrow. It's going to be dry. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a direct line to God up in heaven, you know? Donald, you don't trust God when it comes to concrete. You call the plants, Donald, every one of them, I and will. get them to fax okay. the order back so you can check it. I will, I'll do that, I'll do that now. Did you speak to Garrett? Yes, I did, actually. He's calling Chicago. So I'm guessing Chicago is going to fire me and he'll put some fucking kid on it, so... Oh, no, no, Don't take no. his calls. Just don't take his calls. Don't listen to well, anybody I else. I calls. Don't take his calls. Don't listen to anybody else until the morning. This is me and you, okay? So I'm not going to answer his calls? No. Just me and you, till the morning, okay? Okay. Cool. Fucking hell, okay. Those are instead of tears, those. I know, this is better than I'm afraid I can't get to the phone. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, someone closed the windows. Well, did you talk to anyone about the pain? No, no one's been in. But is, but is everything all right? No. It hurts like nothing ever. Okay, well, I'm on the M6. Uh, an hour and a quarter if the traffic stays okay. You must speak to someone about the pain. Um, just then I felt like I hate you. Well, we don't know each other better, and that's the simple truth. This thing does happen. This thing? So we can't really love each other or hate each other, can we? This thing just happened and that's it and it will go up and down i suppose but at least i'm coming okay do you do you hate me for going through with it i don't know you so i don't hate you do i i, mean, I don't know you so look I wanted Ivan to have what i think of as a reckless integrity it's complete honesty which is always destructive i mean please be quick yes but and he won't say he's sick he won't say he loves bethan he won't lie to his wife on this night. And the whole story is a test of what happens when, when someone does that. 
that police car that just went by wasn't a happy accident. That was the police escort that we had, and they would get bored, and they would sometimes just shoot past with their lights flashing to get into the film. And it works great, often. So we kept some of them in. Chicago is having a predictable meltdown. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I gave them... Uh, I gave them the whole 10-year thing about your 10 years working for Park without a foot wrong. Nine and, years. Um, uh, I've been with you nine years. Nine years. Yeah, the whole thing, Ivan. He said he goes on emotion. He said the stuff about the biggest poor in Europe. Outside the nuclear and military, I know. I know. <sighs> well, I'll tell you what, Ivan. You're fired, is what it is. They said they had no choice. I said, um... I told them about the 10 years. Nine years. But they said they had no choice. Yeah, nine, ten, whatever. So it's okay, it's okay. I'll never do this on the phone. It's okay. Ivan. It's okay. I will still make sure the board is all right. No, Ivan, this, it's, it's not a matter for negotiation. They've decided you're fired completely as of right this second. I know. I heard you and I don't blame them. Okay, but I'm not trying to keep my job. I just, I just want the poor to go okay tomorrow. Ivan, listen to me. Know. You listen to me. I want the poor to go okay, not because of the money. I want it to go right for myself and for the building, right, and for the concrete. I won't let it be pumped into the wrong place. Do you understand? Tonight and tomorrow, I will stay on this, and stay on this, and make sure the concrete gets poured right. Ivan, listen. I told them about the ten years, Fuck, but they weren't ten having years. any of listen it. Listen to me, Gareth. Ivan, the concrete, I... listen, Gareth. The concrete will come. I will take care of it, okay? I know I don't have a job anymore, but I will do this anyway as a favor to the building and to the concrete. Ivan, you sound different. I am the same. Why didn't you just say you were sick? Because I'm not sick. And I'll make sure the board is okay. Yeah, but I've already handed it over to another construction director. Ivan, he's going to pick it up from... I think just around this time, the lights look so great. It's Harris discovered a, um, and I can't remember the name of it, but there's a piece of equipment that hadn't been used, I think, since the 60s, which was some sort of reflection device, which enhanced the real reflections and made everything look quite beautiful, I think. And when I spoke with Harris before we started shooting, the ambition was to have something that would work with no visuals, so it would work just sound, so you could play it on the radio but also have something that would work if you turn the sound down and just looked at it. You know, it would be quite intriguing. And the idea is that outside of the car is chaos, the chaos of the universe, and inside in the bubble of light is Ivan trying to create order. I have felt scraped out for months. She phoned and said that she was having a baby and keeping it because it was her last chance to be happy. And then tonight she phoned and said the water's broken. It's two months early. I was, I was, I was going to tell you before, but the water's broke early. So I have to do this now in the car. Every night I was, I was going to tell but you. But I can't, I, I can't really breathe. Katrina, listen, look, you know what I... happened with my dad, right? Now that bastard wasn't around for me. He didn't even give no, me a fucking name. No, no, you're confused, Ivan. It's you. That's the bastard. It's the baby that's the bastard. For God's sake, I've at least get the no, word Katrina, right. Katrina, listen. No, I, I will give the baby my name and it, it will see my face. And it will know and it won't spend its life thinking, you know, and thinking that... No, 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 I've closed the door and I'm in the dark and I'm almost sure this isn't you. Please don't be... I know, I should have, I should have said all this a long time ago. I'm so, I have behaved not at all like myself. <laughs> I have to put the phone down again. No, I, Katrina, I, please don't go. I have to throw him again, please. It's this constant crunching of gears, which I think all of us in our lives 
we run a masterclass every day of acting where when our cell phone or hands-free phone rings and we see who's calling, we change. We become the person who deals with that person. And so we're all many people during the day, during our lives. And this is watching someone under great duress having to do that and having to deal with so many different situations, which is what's happened to us because we're now all available to all areas of our lives at all times. All right, you still there? Well, what does it say on the whiteboard? On the, it says it says C six. What does it say on every piece of paperwork and on every sign off sheet? It says C six. It says C six. And you know why? Because eventually, when my building is complete, it will be fifty five floors high. It will weigh two million two hundred and twenty three thousand metric tons. Okay, my building will alter the water table and squeeze granite. It will be visible from twenty miles away. At sunset it will cast a shadow probably a mile long. Now, if the concrete at the base of my building is not right, if it slips half an inch, cracks appear. Right? If cracks appear, then they will grow and grow, won't they? And the whole thing will collapse. Why well, don't look? You make one mistake, Don. One little fucking mistake. That's what I call a happy accident. When you're shooting this way and you're actually driving and you're not controlling anything, you're not controlling the traffic, you're not on the sand stage, things just happen. And I have no idea what that van was that came into shot, but it just said it's always been at a very appropriate moment. So, you know, when you open yourself up to chaos, good things happen sometimes. Yeah, we're one mil down. Is, uh, is your mother there? Yeah, hang on. Mum! Sure, we go get Mum. Stupid penalty. Are you listening on the radio? Dad, Dad. No, no. Um, Dad, she's on the toilet, I think. Eddie. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's fine. Listen, I'll uh, I'll talk to you when it all settles down. Okay. All right. This is okay. a reflection on. I'm sure. I don't know whether it's. Just, I think it must be the same around the world with different sports. But fathers and sons, when it's tense and emotional and difficult, you talk about football, and football becomes a sort of analogy for lots of things. And so the game is meant to be Birmingham City playing someone. That's my team. And unlike the real Birmingham City on this night, they win. Unit. Is everything okay? I'm with Bethan Maguire. Is it your partner? Uh, I am the father. She's, she's quite distressed and we're wondering if someone was going to be with her for the birth. She says she doesn't have anyone else. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm an hour away, I think, if the traffic's okay. Is she all right? Well, there's a complication. Well, what is the complication? Uh, it's a complication with the umbilical cord and it means there, there will be a procedure. And it would help if Dad was around. You are Dad. Yes, yes, I am. I'm, uh, I'm driving. I'm, uh, okay. I'm doing 90. Oh, well, please don't drive dangerously or anything. I won't. I'm, uh, well, listen, I'll, I will be there very shortly. Good. Okay, well, she's with the consultant at the moment. I just wanted to make sure someone was coming. Uh, yes, well, I will. I'll be there. Good. So what you need to do is use the emergency entrance and ask for Bailey Ward. Bailey, okay, I will do. She's very emotional. Well, she isn't used to being emotional, I think. I think she's normally a very quiet person. You are her partner. I am the father. I don't, um... I don't know her too well, if you want the truth, no, but I'm coming. She's very afraid. I understand that. I'm driving. That's one of the strange angles that we used to try out um, just to get a bit of air into the thing which I think is particularly beautiful that one I think it's on the record that Steven Spielberg called Tom after viewing this film and he prays upon his performance quite rightly I also spoke to him afterwards and he was talking about the film and how much he loved it and one of the performances he picked out was the midwife which was fantastic Excellent. And they, they have the trucks lined up and the mixes in yes yeah, yeah, I've t ticked off each response after all the fuck yous and piss offs and um, it came to six and a half thousand cubic meters. Okay, what about the retardant? Retardant's on site already, ready to go into the trucks. Good, now, do you have a pen? I have a pencil. Well, get a pen. 
Good. Now, in the top right-hand drawer, above the blow heater, you'll find my folder. Get it. It's going to be your Bible tonight. Okay. Well, I don't see any folder. Yes, no, it's there. It's there. Okay, it's got everything that you're going to need in there. Right? All the numbers, the sign-offs, the road closures that you have to confirm with the police. Now, it's in the drawer above the blow heater. Well, the blow heater was taken by the fucking Hungarians. You think they'd be used to the cold, wouldn't you? Zorno, you do know which drawer that I mean, right? Oh, here, I've checked all the all the drawers. Well, it, it, it... Oh, fuck. What? What? Oh, fuck off. What? Me? Oh, no, not you. I have it here. Shit. All the things you are going to need, and I have it in fact. Fucking here in my car. Well, I don't know. You know, even in all the ten years I've known you, I've never, I've never, I've never known you to fuck up like this. What the fuck's going on? Okay, don't know. Um, will you just give me some time to think? I... Fuck! Ivan only ever shows emotion when no one else is listening, like when he's talking to his father who's not there, or when there's no one on the line. He's a man whose job it is to calm everyone else down and fix problems. And this is one he can't fix. Are you OK? OK. OK. Cat, please, just, just hear what I want to say. Of all the things in the say. world, I never thought of you doing this. Katrina, don't let the boys hear. You fucked some girl. Quietly, quietly. You quietly. fucked her and then me. I looked at my diary and I checked. I remember when you got home from Croydon that weekend and you had a big, stupid grin on your the face. The Brock was in. I was happy with yeah, it. Yeah, and I fixed it in the dark. It was once. What? <laughs> and the difference between once and never is the whole world. The difference between never and once is the difference between good and bad. I know that. You don't know. I know. No, you don't know anything. I know. Yeah, you know. You had a big, stupid grin that night. It was work. The block was down. You fucked someone. It was an odd night. There wasn't really a bad thought in anybody's head. You had a big fucking grin. That isn't it. Sounds like you won something. I remember you smiling and putting your coat on the stairs. I thought you'd won something. I was trying to be normal. I can't remember. Look, the, the block was what, in. What, that was... stuff about the baby? You think she's having a baby? Yes, she's, <laughs> she's having a baby tonight. Oh, is she? <laughs> Oh, forget that. <laughs> You're a clown. Forget that. You're a stupid clown. You think it's yours? Why would it be yours if she fucks everybody? She doesn't. Oh, if she fucks you, she fucks everybody. She isn't like that. She had given up on having anything. I can't believe it's me and you, and we're talking about somebody else. There's somebody broke into the house. I just... I want to talk about a practical next step. That becomes Ivan Locke's mantra, is that I want to talk about a practical next step. And even as he says it, we all know that it's not going to happen. But it's the way that Ivan Locke deals with things. It's that rationalist approach, which for this problem isn't going to work. Did you say sad? Yes. I think we got cut off. Okay, yes, I have the file here. Hang on a second. Okay, I have the file here. I'm going to have to give All you right. some information over the phone. And you're going to have to write it down, okay? <laughs> okay. Donald, are you, are you drinking something? What are you drinking? Um, a nice bottle of fizzy pop. Okay, I need you to call the duty officer at Belmont Police Station and confirm some road closures for the morning. Okay, do you still have the pen? Uh, oh yeah. Right, okay. Uh, here are the roads we agreed with the council that need to be closed to traffic for the duration of the pour, which is from 5.25 a.m. to midday. Yeah, up you go. Crescent Road between Arch Green Crescent Road between Arch Green and Claremont. Okay, Plane Tree Road at the south end only. Plane Tree Road at the south end only, yeah. The Vale up to Parklands Farm Road. 
Okay, yeah. But with the stop cooperated by us. Yeah, I got that. You need to quote the license number 750. 750. Slash TV. Okay. Slash TV. Cool, you're okay. Got it. Good. Donald, it is fizzy pop that you're drinking. It yes? is. It, it is. It is. Because if you are on the fucking side, huh? And I find out. I will cut your legs off with a fucking pavement saw. Oh, will you? All oh, right. Now, Ivan, Ivan, listen to me. There's no need for you to talk to me like that, okay? Because I've got six calls here that I'm looking at stacked up on this phone from Gareth, and I'm guessing what they are and what he's saying to me on the phone calls. But I agree that I'm not going to take those phone calls from Gareth because I'm fucking shitting my pants here, you know, about tomorrow going pair, and I don't want him to give me some fucking college kid on the phone trying to talk me through this from scratch. So, as far as I'm concerned, until the sun comes up, yours is the only voice that I'm going to listen to. But hear this. Don't fucking threaten me! You have a okay? call waiting. You have no official position now to threaten me from. So don't fucking threaten me! So it is cider that you're drinking? The traffic jam that we hit there and the police incident was real and we decided at the very beginning that anything that happened regarding traffic we would go with, we wouldn't stop, we wouldn't fake it. It's what happens on real motorways. And it just happened on that night that it was perfect timing to give full effect to Donal's fantastic rant. And it wasn't cider they were drinking, it was red wine they were drinking. Ivan Locke? They say there's a twist. A what? Um, it's, it's round the baby's neck like a um, noose. Well, you're in the best place. Honestly, you are. You're in the best place. Hey, um, let me use my phone for one minute. Oh! Oh! When will you get here? About 45 minutes, I'm uh, outside Northampton, the traffic is okay. We calibrated the um, the journey and sort of back-timed everything so that we were in story terms, we were in the right place at the right time. We shot some of this on the real motorways M6 and M1, which are the roads between Birmingham and London. It was difficult to get permission to film on those motorways, so we also did some stuff on circuits, which were on the M25 and east of London. If you're not British, I think these things will mean nothing. But they are basically the biggest and busiest motorways that run down the middle of the country. And we also shot free driving. So whenever we're looking forward from behind Ivan, that's Tom really driving the car. He's not on the low loader. We are in the back seat with the cameras and the calls were fed through. And when he was on the low loader, Tom had auto cue. So he had the script in front of him, he had it in the GPS and he had it in the rear view mirror. But when, obviously when he's free driving, he can't use an auto cue without crashing. So we would feed the calls in and then it was towards the end of the shooting period. So Tom would have absorbed some of the script and he would respond. However, we did it really to get the genuine driving shots of him driving forward. But in fact, we also got some great dialogue stuff out of it when we were shooting with free driving. Bethan? Oh, Jesus. You think this is all fake, don't you, Dad? You dirty fucking fingerprints all over me. But it was bound to happen because of the little seeds that you planted. Okay, well, let me educate you. Even no matter what the situation is, you can make it good. This is Harris at his finest. It's beautiful, I think. And I think one of the things that first attracted me to making this film was having come off at making a more conventional film, we tested digital cameras by shooting from inside a moving vehicle to test the sensitivity of the cameras. And we'd sit in the theatre and watch it on the screen, and I thought it was just hypnotic and beautiful and wondered if you couldn't turn that moving image, the, the thing that you're seeing now with all those lights and, and, and movement, turn that into a theatre and have an actor in there perform a play and film it. So that was sort of one of the original ideas. And I think that the way Harris did this is, is quite remarkable. Earn good money, cash in hand, working on the crossrail. They make 500 a day just shoveling shit. Shoveling shit about like you. No, I'm going to drive straight to the worst place for me. The worst place on earth for me to be, even though this woman is like... She's like sad and lonely, hardly bothered with life at all. I felt sorry for her, you know. I 
felt sorry for her. So how can that be the difference between good and bad? You've got to put it on the radio. It's brilliant. Is your mother there? <laughs> um, no, she's upstairs on the toilet. Um, she's been in there ages. She's wearing the shirt, but she won't come down. Um, do you want me to call her? No, no, we we'll just leave. It's, uh, it's okay. Go on, you enjoy the game. That's one of my favourite shots. Though. I think it's absolutely lovely. Why are you a man? I should have used it more. Really. I am, Eddie. I'm, I'm going, I'm going mad inside, but I'm driving, and I'm. Uh... The editor Justine Wright did a magnificent job of sorting through the material, 16 versions of the film, three cameras on each. So that is a lot of hours of, of footage. And she attacked that Herculean task with absolute aplomb. In the end, it was quite useful because the nature of the background means that there isn't a continuity issue, really. So what we could do is cut between any performance from any night and it would still work, it would still be valid. It also meant that we could really select purely according to performance. And when the performance was right, that's what we used. And then we would always have three angles on that particular performance that night. So that was a real luxury when it came to the edit. I was wondering um, if anyone had called you about road closures. Um, yeah, we had some Irish guys oh. here standing in. Good, yes. I'm uh, just double checking the closures are all confirmed, yes? Uh, uh, one minute. Uh, no, there's. Um there's a problem with the veil what? stop and go. There's a problem with the veil stop and go. The council have questioned the license at the last oh, minute. Shit. So uh, I was going to call them in the morning. Was it too late? I'm sorry? We have to control the road to get the trucks in and out of the south gate. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Lock. You'll have to, you'll have to take that up with the council. But it's 9 o'clock. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the council offices are closed, aren't they? That's right, but I can't ratify until the council sign off on okay. the stop and go. Okay, no, no, so no, I, I understand, okay, I understand, you'll get a call. How long are you on duty for? You have a call waiting. Well, you've got another 25 minutes. Okay, look, you'll get a call, okay? You'll get a call. Mostly when you hear the, you have a call waiting, some of them are in there for, it feels appropriate to the drama, but also the BMW we were using since we weren't driving for real, we hadn't bothered to fill it with petrol, so it was very low on petrol for safety reasons. But the car warned you that you're low on petrol by making this sort of zing noise every now and then. And we didn't know why it was making this noise, and it was driving us mad. But this warning noise kept happening, and towards the end of the performance, when it happens, Tom sort of bangs the steering wheel and reacts to it because it's so annoying. So... Instead of cutting that, we kept the reaction, and instead of the zing noise, we put in you have a call waiting. So it looks like he's reacting to yet another call coming in. So again, trying to make use of happy accidents was the policy. Dad, I can't believe you're not here. It's amazing. 2-1. I know, I know, Sean. Um, <coughs> sorry. Sean, I need you to do me a favour. There's, um... You have a call waiting. There's been a cock up at work, and I need to speak to someone in, uh, in my blue coat in the kitchen. Yes, there's a notebook. There's a phone number in the notebook of somebody called Cassidy who works for the council clerk works. I need the number. Why don't you ask Mum? Please, Sean, please, just get the number. Text it to me. Cassidy, it's under C. It's very urgent. Dad, is Mum all right? She hasn't come down. It's half time. Sean, in the morning, I will talk to you about everything. OK? Now you just get me the number of Cassidy, please. Hello, can I speak to Ivan Locke? This is Ivan Locke. I'm Dr. Halil Gulu. I'm the senior obstetrician at St. Mary's Hospital. You have uh, a we call have a Bethan McGuire here who's given us this number as the number of her next of kin. Uh, are you her What's next happening? of kin? Uh, I'm sorry, are you the next of kin? I am the father. Uh, excuse me, hang on. Mr. Locke, I'm sorry, um, we have a situation here where the baby's umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. Yes, I know, yes. And the baby is very distressed. And you're going to carry out a cesarean? 
Yes, that's right. But Miss Maguire says she wants to wait until you are here. Ah, well, she's distressed. She's, she's quite an odd person, I think. Look, if we're going to get her to cooperate, I really need you to speak to of her. Of course you, you do. That, yes, please? no, absolutely. Go on, put her on. Thank you very much. Please hold the line. Nothing. They want to do it now. Right. Well, let them do it. That was, a, again, a real drive-by police, which wasn't planned by us and they weren't our escort. But, again, when the performance is right and these things happen, we just keep them in. Where are you? I'm on the motorway. Luton. Now you let them do it and don't be silly. Fuck you! Ivan, you know I told them it was one night. I told them about the room and feeling so sad after. Yes. Because the nurse said if he's coming all this way down, he must feel something. Okay, we just want to try get pregnant safe. I told them I love you, even if it was just once. Well, there's no need to say that. And it'll be up. Yes. How far away are you? Bethan, now a baby is something that cannot be stopped. You have to take all the practical steps to prepare. You want me to let them cut the open? Yes, I mean, it is, it is the best thing. I'll do it because I love you. Okay, then. Can you not say it back even once? No, I can't. Look, I can't. But I can be there as fast as the traffic will allow. As you will probably have noticed, the Ivan is Welsh and the accent is Welsh. And we chose that accent because we wanted a working class accent that wasn't too harsh and didn't come with too much baggage. It's quite soothing and calm, even though it's feasible that someone with that accent would come from a very poor background. And when we um, first talked about him being an ordinary person, Tom decided to use a, someone he knew who he considered to be a solid, practical man who he believed to be Welsh, so he said, I'll do a Welsh accent. He subsequently found out that the man he based the whole thing on actually isn't Welsh. And he was contacted by a Welsh newspaper saying, what's it like to have Tom Hardy play you? And he said, it's very flattering, but I'm not Welsh. So. I'm falling apart at home and you're closing roads. Not a closure, it's a stop. The, the woman door. is giving birth and you're closing roads. Since you've told me about this woman, you have been getting further and further away from who I know. Or no, actually it might be that I do know. And there's his father watching. In the in the kitchen, your footprints they go hard and I have to chip them away. You leave concrete behind you everywhere. Katrina, I, I love you. Okay, I made one mistake. I don't feel anything for this woman, and I'm trying to do the right thing tonight because she is on her own and the baby is my fault. And I know how it feels to be coming out into the world like this. There is someone being brought into the world and it's my fault. So I have to fix it, somehow. Oh my God. I would really like it if you would say that you will wait and I can come back and we can talk, we can talk about it, and that we can fix something up. But I, I really want to know that tomorrow I can drive home and talk to the boys and be at home as normal. And we can go out or something and have a drink and talk about it. I want to know that I am not driving in one direction. I want to know that I will be driving back when the sun comes up. Ivan, let me ask you a question. Do you still want me to give you the phone number so you can close the road? Yes. Right, well, goodbye, Ivan. When the film was screened at the London Film Festival, I sat in and at that moment when Katrina says, do you still want me to give you the phone number? There was a lady sitting directly behind me, and I heard a whisper, just say no. And of course, Ivan says yes. That's what made me want to make this film shots like that and that the wristband by the way is a help for heroes um, wristband part of the charity that Tom really gets involved with
Yes. I, I, I think I've just done something on my own initiative. You did. I found the mobile number for, for, the, for the council guy who signs off the closures. Cassidy? Yeah, Cassidy. I, 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 that's him. You found his number? Yeah, I have his mobile number. I, I knew you'd need it. You took it over, over Christmas in case and I found it. Donald, you did that. Yeah, and that's on two cans of fucking cider. Do you want it? Okay, right. Well, you know, give me the number. Okay, okay, okay. 0770 0770950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950950
Donald, how many siders have you had? Donald? Donald, I don't have Stefan's number. You'll need to drive down there. They'll be knocking off and going home in like half an hour. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be straight with you. I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk, okay, but I've, I've had too much to get behind the wheel. If I get stopped again, I go inside. I, I can't do that. Okay, then you run. I run? Yeah, Stefan and his men will knock off in half an hour due to council regulations because they can't burn bitumen lights after 10. So if you run, you'll get there before they get in their van. What do you mean run? I don't, I'm not, I don't fucking run. You will fucking run, run, Donald. I haven't run. I'm not, I'm not. You will I'm fucking run, run now. Hey. Go or my building won't get built. <laughs> are, you, are you mad? Yes. Run. I'm not. Yes, I'm mad. Tonight I've gone f <laughs> mad and I will have to get used to being mad. You and have Donald, a ball waiting. I can hear in your that voice. That was the low on drunk. petrol noise. No, but when you're drunk, you can run faster, can't you? For a while at least, you can run like a fucking kid. You right, can sorry. run like the fucking right. wind. <laughs> so I'm gonna get out of my boots, I'm gonna put on my trainers, my, my yes. run fast trainers. Yes, I'll let you you run. Right. So you want me to run? Run for those fucking bastards in Chicago and I don't give a shit if I live or if I die. No, I, I, you do it for the piece of sky we are stealing with our building. You do it for the air that will be displaced. And most of all, you oh, do it for the God. fucking concrete. Because it is delicate as blood. You really have gone fucking mad, right? Well, that, that would be a fair assessment, yes. <laughs> All right. Woo! Woo! Right, Ivan, here I go! Oh, you're a Woo! good man, Don. You are, you're a good man. Woo! Go on, now run. Run. Moments like that when you realise that Tom and Andrew are good friends and that was played differently every night, but it was so great when they both sort of started laughing. And it was sort of, I don't know, it, it indicates or reflects how even in a time of crisis like this, sometimes you just have to laugh because that's the way it is. Also, I wanted to introduce this character of Stefan, who is a labourer who can sort everything out. Because in the brief time that I spent on building sites, I learned that labourers did often be one labourer who wasn't qualified in any way, who actually knew more than everybody else about everything. I worked on a building site once for a, quite a big building and it was the third floor had already been built and it was a labourer who pointed out there was no elevator shaft and so they had, they had to knock some things down and build one. You see? Life. Yes. Life sentence. So what? I will do what needs to be done even if they hate me or love me. You have to be solid, so that it makes no difference what they think. You know, if I were to bury you tonight, again, before I threw dirt on your face, I would say, look, look and fucking learn. I drove in this direction, and there will be a new person when I get there. Yes, because of that night, constructed out of two bottles of wine, and somebody feeling lonely. How could you ever be that for a construction? I like this moment because it's Ivan the rationalist realising that something he did that was a mistake, that wasn't rational, that was very human, has actually outranked his achievement in building a building. We won. Ah, oh, what was the score? 3-1. Good, good. Good. Robinson Here is what I think is an example of men talking about football instead of their emotions and, and using football as a substitute, which I think is perfectly valid myself. No, uh, Mom looks like she's seen a ghost. She's broken place. Yes, well, something's happened. I'll, um, I'll explain when I'm not driving. upstairs yes I'll, ex I'll explain when i'm not driving and when i'm with you and eddie together you know i uh i've only just explained it to myself she said you're not coming home ever well she's she, she's distressed are you coming home where where else would i go so i'll tell eddie that you are coming in he's been crying look when I get to the other end, I'll call. Sean, you tell Eddie that it's okay, that I'll make it okay, okay? 
doesn't feel like it's okay. It felt different after half time. I'll fix it. And it'll all go back to normal. Now you should go to bed. Yeah. Third goal was amazing. Caldwell. Yeah, took around a keeper. Good God, Caldwell's a donkey. Now, normally he's a donkey, but tonight he was brilliant. That's a miracle. What a miracle. Right, that's it. Go on, good night. Night, Dad. See you tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Hopefully. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. One of the reasons for making the film like this was that there's something interesting about people when they're using a the telephone because their voice will say one thing and their face will tell you another and it's a really shorthand way of getting to the truth about someone that the voice is their self to the world, to the exterior and their face is what's really going on so you instantly know that that's the real thing so when he's trying to stay calm and fatherly to his son and you see tears you're getting the two individuals in one go and it's sort of almost like a cheat of a way of seeing into someone's soul his name is Stefan. His name is Stefan. Donald, give him 500 oh, each. Oh, my God. I'm fucking... I'm fucked. You sound sober. Now, listen. You tell Stefan to bring two men and a jack. 500 apiece. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I'll call you when I've got the poles in my... my fuck. In my grasp, OK? What? Jeez, my heart is coming out. Stefan is a good man. He will fix the pit and check the others. All 12 pumps will work. The stop go will run. The north, south, east and west gates will all take their quarter of concrete. The baby will be born and Katrina will be okay. In the morning she will be okay. That is how it can be. That is my prayer. And when the baby is born, when he's seven, or when she's seven, it'll say it's okay, and that the name will be Locke. Oh, Locke is okay. We do okay because, because I straightened the name out. The Locks were a long line of shit, but I straightened the name out. You know what? You old bastard, you know what? I know now. I know now why you ran away. Yeah? Okay, okay, okay. I'm in a, I'm in a van with three poles who smell like fucking burning rooftops. And they said 600, right? So I guess you're, you're going to say yeah? Yes. Yeah, good, okay. This guy, Stephanie, doesn't say much, does he? Well, but no, but he's a good man. Well, you want a word with him? No. Stephen knows what to do. He'll be okay now, Donald. Yeah, we'll fix yeah. up the rebars and start preparing yeah. the gates. Okay. It'll be a long night. Jesus, I'm so cold sober now. <laughs> I know, I know, it all worked out. Huh? I said, wait, 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 wait. Stefan just said, say hello. He said, say hello to Ivan Locke. <laughs> what? All right. He said, he said to say, you're the best man in England. <laughs> Ivan? Yes? I've decided. Kat, you know what? We, we can work this out. I know we can. No, no, no. I, I've spoken to my sister and my half-sister. And the difference between once and never is everything. So, that's it. And it never is once, anyway. Katrina, so I don't want you to come back, Ivan. This is not your home anymore, and I want you to stay away. Katrina, please, listen to me. Look, we will make arrangements for seeing the boys. But look, I, I don't want you coming here. You're always more in love with your buildings anyway. Oh, you know, why don't you go and live in one of them? You're right at the top. Where you like to look out and feel so pleased with yourself. Yeah, I'm going to wash everything here. Wash it all out ten times to get the dust of you out of it. I won't have to deal with your footprints turning to stone on the kitchen floor anymore. <laughs> it's finished. This isn't your home. At this point, all happy accidents welcome. This piece of road with the arrow and things, people can make of it what they will. And also the men working late at night, it's sort of, who knows, maybe they've all got the same story. And the people driving the trucks, you know, it's sort of an ordinary tragedy, really, and something that can happen.
and Ivan's solution to the problem is the thing that makes him exceptional, I think. These scenes were shot as we got closer to London, so the lights get sort of more intense and the traffic gets heavier. And this is real stuff on the motorway. This is us in the back seat shooting forward with Tom driving for real. I think we were pretty much where we are in the story. Wherever possible, we tried to do that. And this is sort of approaching London, approaching the destination. Ivan Lock. Ivan, I've put a construction director onto this. He's trying to reach Donal a hundred times, but Donal isn't picking up. Are you there, Ivan? Yes. Look, can you reach Donal and tell him he's got to pick up his phone immediately? Ivan? You tell your construction director there's no need to speak to Donal. Everything's already taken care of. Ivan, for fuck's sake, I can't Everything do Everything is this. taken care of. And everything is ready for 525. There will be no you mistakes. Have a call waiting. I have made sure of everything, and I've made sure everything is in place. You can go to sleep now, Gareth. Good night. You know, I, I actually threw up earlier. Yeah. Fucking yeah. Well, hear this, Gareth. When I left the site just over two hours ago, I had a job, a wife, a home. And now I have none of those things. I have none of those things left. I just have myself in the car that I'm in. And I'm just driving, and that's it. Ivan, you fucked up your life, that's your business, but Chicago is going insane. Hmm. Two words I learned tonight. Fuck Chicago. We screened the film in Chicago a couple of times, and both times that line got a real laugh which was great, because I wasn't sure how people would take to it. But they enjoyed it, which is good. And this is pretty much the end of the motorway, this is the exit, so we're getting toward... Those who know their motorways know that this is coming towards the end of the journey and London. Yeah. Um, Teddy, <laughs> I'm on my mobile. I'm under the duvet. I, um, I just wanted to tell you about the goal. <laughs> Cal Caldwell got it and, and he controlled it, you know? You know how you shout at him because it always flies off into the crowd. <laughs> yeah, he he controlled it and, yeah, and he got it down on the ground and, and you know how he says he just lumps it forwards all the time. Well, he got it down on the ground. This is Caldwell, Dad, and, and he just he just started running and, and running and running. And, <laughs> and these defenders were just bouncing off him. And he went down one, and then the other, and me and Sean were standing up and shouting at him to pass the ball, pass the ball. You know, if you say you've got a square in. He wouldn't square it, he wouldn't pass, he just... <laughs> he just kept running, he was... He, he, he looked like a horse or something. And then the goalie's coming forward, and, and, and we think he's going to boot it over the bar. Um, re remember, I guess... The point of that look into the rearview mirror is pretty obvious that Ivan believes he's done the right thing, he's made this journey, but the consequence for his kids is the same as the consequence was for him when his dad wasn't there. And so has he won or lost? And was it worth it is the question. Put it in. Um, Mum was crying, so she didn't, she didn't even see it. Um, but, but we recorded it for you, so you have to come home and watch it, OK? You, you have to come home and, and I have I have an idea. Okay, so we, we'll pretend we don't know the score and pretend it's happening then. Pretend it's live and 
me and Sean will go mad all the same. And you can have your beer and Mum can make the sausages, so... So that's what we'll do. Good night, Dad. So this is coming towards the final scene and the result, and we chose a location, a pretty desperate little side road off the North Circular, which is the road that goes around London, to shoot it. And we discovered as we were shooting, it was what I suppose you'd euphemistically call lover's lane. So maybe there were some babies born as a consequence this night, or maybe some babies that weren't born as a consequence of us being there filming. Is everything okay? Listen. We went to great lengths to get a genuinely newborn baby to cry. And I'd like to think that maybe the baby was called Ivan, but I have no idea. But I hope that this ending is a question, was it worth it? There's a baby born and so much damage done, but, you know, it's, it's for an audience to decide. But also, I wanted to pull away, this is the second time we used a crane, to pull away and look at traffic to suggest that within each one of these vehicles, there's a story, which could be, you know, just another ordinary tragedy or a triumph or a comedy or whatever it might be, and then just see them as, as lights that are moving around. And that's Ivan Locke, and it's Locke, and it began life as an idea of looking at lights just like that that are on screen now, and trying to pick out one of those moving lights and tell a story that people could identify with. So that was the ambition. The music is, I think, fantastic on the film. Dick and Hinchcliffe did a wonderful job. It was one of those things where, do we have music or not? Do we make this ultra naturalistic? But I think the music is earned in this. We had someone else who tried to do it and couldn't sort of grasp the concept, but then Dickon came in and he really did do justice to the drama. In other words, created music that would be appropriate to bigger events. And they almost make the events that happen in the story, they dignify them, if you like. And I think it's an absolute triumph for the school. Thank you. <laughs>